Hi guys, I'm Laura Graves and welcome to course one of my master class. In this course, we're gonna cover your horse's responsiveness to your aids. For me, that entails first and foremost, identifying your aids. Your aids are different than my aids. We're gonna talk about the legs and the reins. We're gonna talk about the use of the seat. And we're gonna talk about different types, different levels of horses, different experience, different strength levels of the horses, and how I try to approach each horse based on what I think they know and how strong they are so that I know what is fair to ask of them in that moment and what is knowledge they should have that they should give me a correct response so that I feel fair using a correction and also when they make a mistake. Um, I'm very comfortable here with my horses making a mistake. For me a mistake is just when the horse gives me a try. Right, so anything that a horse tries is a positive reaction to my aid, even if it's not perfect. We wanna focus on the fact that the horse is responsive. Even if in your head it might feel like failure, you have to remember that the horse trying something is better than the horse trying nothing. And my goal for you is to become very comfortable with your horse trying and making mistakes and not becoming discouraged, but staying very focused on the path of education that you're trying to lead your horse down. In my travels all over the world, one of the most common threads in people's training, especially when it comes to dressage, is the fear of making a mistake. And I think because we're so focused on our sport is supposed to look so beautiful that we are embarrassed or scared of what happens when it doesn't look beautiful, when it looks chaotic, when the horse isn't all of these things that we feel are a reflection of ourselves. And so we take it very personally and I try to every day have a sense of humor both about myself and about my horses. Um, and it helps me stay positive in the training and I like to encourage people to make mistakes because if you're not trying something new every day, um, sometimes those mistakes are the only way that you find success. I hope you guys enjoy this first course. Stay tuned until the very end where I'm going to guide you through a self-diagnostic with your horse that you can do in your own time to measure your aids and your horse's responsiveness to them. So hopefully we have a starting point to measure how much progress we're making. No matter what your level of riding or your horse's current level of training, this system will apply to everyone. Whether you're a training level rider with a horse who's just learning to steer on some 20 meter circles, whether you're practicing your diagonals or your correct leads in the canter, or whether you're a finished Grand Prix rider and we're working on keeping the Piaf on time right on the spot, we're practicing our flying changes, sticking true to this system and these sets of parameters are gonna make your riding even sharper. I know these ideas can be frustrating I know it's easy to get down on yourself when it doesn't feel like it's going well. I'm gonna stick in there with you guys to try to see these mistakes through to the end so you can see the success even when it doesn't feel like it. When we talk here about the primary aids, um, it has probably come up with you and your own training with your coach, or maybe you've read about the seat a lot. Heck, we know in dressage we're supposed to sit the trot. Um, but for me, the primary aids are really the leg and the hand, right? Also, we could call it the reins. Um, and the leg maybe we'll also put here corrective. We'll go into this later, but we would say maybe the spurs um, and say the whip for a corrective driving aid. And only when we truly have the horse understanding how to accept the leg into the contact. I heard um, Kyra Kirkland recently use the phrase, in order to have contact, you have to take contact. Okay, so we have to be the initiators of that and the regulators of it. And when the horse really understands using their energy to squeeze up to that boundary of the rein or the bridle and and they start to lift their back they start to find this suppleness left and right this impulsion back to front and they find what is throughness and the back softens now i find it a place where when these two come together we can discuss the use of the seat 
But until the horse's back is in a place to receive the rider's seat, it's rather an uncomfortable place for the horse and an uncomfortable place for us to sit. I'm super happy posting the trot all day long if that's where I get the most swing out of my horse. There comes a moment, um, of course we sit at the walk, usually we sit at the canter, but the trot seems to be a real place where people think they need to use their seat, maybe before they've put the leg and the hand aids together to create a horse that's through enough to be able to sit nicely on the horse. So. If we are ineffective with your leg and your reins and your horse is not through and we're being told to sit, this is kind of an oil water situation for me. It's uncomfortable for the horse. The horse is bouncier, their back is rigid, their back is tight, their back is almost trying to pop you out of the saddle. And yes, some of us professionals have nice seats, but hopefully all of us professionals have the ability to combine the leg and the hand to make our horses through. So maybe we sit the trot a little bit better than some people, but we're probably very effective at making the horse through, which makes the trot more comfortable to sit. So before I ever pressure my students to sit the trot, I wanna make sure they're effective in creating a trot that's comfortable for them and comfortable for the horse to have us sitting on their back. Throughout my travels, you know, I teach clinics all over the world and this topic sometimes comes up and I'd be teaching a clinic and the first four riders of the day would go and lunchtime would roll around and people would come up to me and they'd say, you know, Laura, you haven't, you haven't talked about the seat at all. And I would say, okay, the first four riders really haven't been able to put our horses in a position where they're going to be refined enough in their own training with a soft enough back to receive a message from the seat. And they would say, well, don't you think that first rider, if, if, the, if she had just sat into her horse and picked him up with her seat, that he would have been in a lot more self-carriage. And I thought, well, there's a trick. You're gonna pick up that 1200 pound animal with your crotch, this I have to see. Okay, so for me, that's just not, it's not real, right? It's a very complicated thing where the horse has to provide you the tool to be able to communicate with him. So if the, the leg and the hand are not connected, there's no bridge there. There's no bridge for you to sit on the back. You're sitting in a giant hole and, and nobody will see you in there. No one's gonna receive your message. You have to wait until you've built this bridge from the leg to the hand that the horse is ready and waiting to receive that message from possibly your seat. Maybe you sit a little bit heavier. Maybe you change the tempo. But if any time it takes the swing out of it, you need to go back to rising trot and check the throughness of your horse from leg to hand. So what do I mean by throughness? This is again where it's measured very differently from horse to horse. Um, hence why we don't tend to sit the trot at the lower level. We don't tend to sit the trot on a younger horse. So it is increasing as that horse's fitness and as that horse's education level increases. And we start sitting the trot more and more. As you get to a medium level of dressage, you have an option to sit or to post the trot. And as you hit second, third level and up, now it's expected that you have a through horse. So we talk about this, but what does it mean? It's an understanding between the energy of the horse that they've learned to maintain. They understand my leg, here's the limit. This is the speed you're going to go. This is the amount of energy I expect you to provide me with every stride. I'm not gonna beg you, this is your job now. And here's the limit I'm giving you in the hand. My reins are this long. Here's the amount of contact I like to hold, different than what you like to hold, that's okay. Here's the amount of ounces I like in my reins. You might want less, that's okay. Set it up, be consistent, communicate that to your horse. And, and these are the limits I need you to stay between. We're going to incorporate in this course, um, checking the lateral flexibility of your horse, the, the front to back, um, back to front flexibility of your horse in order to find this feeling of throughness. The, the fact of the matter is that until you feel it, it's rather easy to see because it looks soft, it looks beautiful, it looks like the horse is carrying the rider. But until you feel it yourself, this will be a light bulb moment. Throughness is a light bulb moment for a lot of riders when they feel it, um, that the horse naturally picks himself up they find a better cadence, they find a better self-carriage, and it's through, through the perimeter that we give them with our legs and our hands that we create that swinging back. When I talk about swing, 
horse that can swing is only a horse that is through. We may as well be speaking a foreign language, right? So for me, the horse can't swing if he's not connected throughout his entire body. The hind legs might seem really far away from the bit, but in that moment that the horse has to swing, he has to have a flexibility over his entire spine from his tail all the way to his ears that he finds it possible to use both sides of his body the same and that when I ask him to compress with those hind legs, that he finds this ability to compress somewhere in his body, right? Hopefully over the back, it might not be every time, it might not be at first, but eventually we hope that's the place he learns to give, that then the horse can use his hind legs better under his body because the back is up and he has the space to do so. If you might be struggling to think that these basics apply to you, I promise you, they do. Check your work, everybody. I can't tell you, riding through the Grand Prix, I never once rode down center line and thought to myself about a complex issue. I thought, is my horse going too fast? Are they not going enough? Is he good on the left? Is he good on the right? And when you break it down that simply, it keeps things really, really steady, really easily communicated so you're not catching your horse off guard. And it keeps us focused on the details. People always think it looks so flawless. It was a lot of work in the beginning, but in the end, it really was pretty easy because I didn't have to think too hard about where I was going to touch my horse, where I was going to communicate with my horse because I was able to pause and identify rather than trying to push the horse through the test, push the horse through the movement, hold the horse through the movement, hold the horse down, hold them on the bit, kick them to the bit. Um, it's really this understanding that the horse starts to take responsibility for their own training. Before we move on, here's something I want you guys to do in your workbook. I want you to, when we put it in writing, it's real, right? So go to your workbook. I want you to write down your aids. I want you to write down your aid for walking off from the halt. I want you to write down your aid for moving on to the trot, moving on to the canter. I want you to write down your aid for coming down from each of those gates and your aid for halt and so that you really are holding yourself accountable in writing that you can look back for what you think your aid was when you wrote it on paper and what you actually did when you got in the saddle. Okay guys, so this is Charmy and his owner Jenny. Um, they are very new to each other. Charmy is new to America. Uh, we haven't had him that long, still getting to know him. Um, it's uh, really a different type of ride for Jenny and, and this will be a great, uh, build on the use of the aids. I think a lot of people are, you know, find themselves in a position getting to know a new horse um, and wondering how, how they're going to start to communicate with each other. And like I said, whenever I get on a new horse or a horse that I ride every day, it's starting from that same scratch place and testing the leg, the reins, and how they react to my aids in order to get them to respond in ways that I want. Um, so Jenny and I are gonna get started in her lesson. And we're going to run just through his basic warm up, uh, walk, trot, canter both ways, testing her leg yields, and, and hopefully getting some feedback here from Jenny about what feels good and if she feels like he's responding to her. I think it's really important that when people um, buy a trained horse that they feel um, empowered to make that horse their own. Just because Charmy here has a lot of buttons doesn't necessarily mean that that's how Jenny's going to push them. And um, we have to kind of reinstall those buttons where, where Jenny's gonna wanna use them and, and how she's gonna wanna use them. So um, I, this is a perfect example of a type of horse who I might ride a little bit differently, but um, you know what I like is different than what Jenny likes. And so it's important for us to make sure that Charmy is comfortable with that and that Jenny is able to install her own limits on this horse, on her aids, so that she feels comfortable piloting around the ring. Um, good, ready, off we go. Let's go to the middle here. Very windy day. And so we're just gonna start at the walk on a big 20 meter circle. And Jenny's just gonna feel how Charmy feels today. And a big deal with this horse, we have learned, is that if he's not on the aids, then we don't have his attention. And he's just a funny guy. He likes to tell some jokes. He's got a good sense of humor. And um, if he's not, if he doesn't have a job to do, he can be a little cheeky. 
and and that can be intimidating for for anybody but especially on a horse you don't know super well um, is how far are they going to take it and we've really uh, tested him in a lot of situations where he's he's just perfectly cheeky he doesn't do anything too naughty but we've learned we really need to keep him on the job so Jenny here is already just without even thinking about it measured his reaction on her leg right like you're walking and I see you using your leg and for me now I need to a big understanding of mine as a trainer actually is understanding what is good for Jenny so where I might be riding Charmy right now oh we've got a bug and be saying to him hey I don't want to touch you with my leg this many times you must stay a little quicker in the walk Jenny's going to be comfortable in a different place so it's really important that we get Charmy comfortable in that place for her not in that place for me um, I think that's a big a big misunderstanding when trainers are helping students so these horses should be capable of all these things and it's why it's important for me to get feedback from Jenny because I'm going to ask her do you feel like he's the way you want him when you ask him to walk a tempo Jenny or do you feel like you're having to beg for it a little bit a little bit, a little bit. so then this is now how far is Jenny willing to take her correction? How much is she willing to risk being out of control in order to get the reaction she wants on the leg? Okay, and these are things we have to measure every time where if she feels like she's working too hard on the leg and she doesn't do anything about it, you can see Charmy's just rather okay letting Jenny work that hard. So I would ask Jenny to then be quiet with her leg and then put her ideal aid on and if she doesn't get the reaction that she likes, then she needs to make a little correction. And her correction should have an effect, right? It doesn't have to make the perfect thing happen. It just has to call Charmy's attention to the fact that that was Jenny's aid for walk on and he didn't listen. Good, I can see her now making corrections on the leg and I see Charmy walking on. Now Jenny, your leg needs to stay quiet. Good, fine, perfect, right? So there she was really picky and she said, still Charmy, that wasn't enough for me. He took a trot step. It was a mistake, right? And this is where, again, we're getting into the box of correct answers for Jenny and Charmy. Mistake, she didn't really want him to trot. She wanted him to walk on, but I would rather he jump to trot and show a difference that he understood that correction than that he continued to walk the same speed. So for me, a correction like that is hopefully effective and I only know by repeating my aid again, right? So now is Charmy staying the walk that you want without you having to drive him? Or if you relax your leg, does he get slow? Good, bump up, good. Now sit quiet, leg off. And you just manage, yeah. If Again, he gets slow, bump up. Good, leg off. Good, and listen, ah, he's behind you again. Tap, tap. Come, little bumps on your spur. There you go. So now we're measuring that just like the horse before, Charmy must stay a certain mile per hour without the leg driving, right? This is in front of the leg. If Jenny is having to kick all the time, it does not then free her leg up for other things that we wanna practice like leg yields, like half passes. So we need to know that Charmy stays walking forward onto the bit before we go yeah, onto anything else. Good, maybe a change of direction, huh? Good, relax that leg. And listen, if he makes the mistake, that mistake is on him. Okay, so now Jenny has changed directions and it might seem obvious that a horse is gonna walk the same way left and right, but it's just not the case. <laughs> and I find the biggest misunderstanding when we're testing the leg in the rain, we got very comfortable a few years ago kicking our horses. And where I think a lot of people still feel uh, timid or intimidated um, is on the bridle and how to use it. And often I think uh, we don't address as much as we should the hollow side, which for most horses is the right side where we're tracking now. And that because it doesn't feel as strong as the left, we don't make sure that the horse understands that right bit. And it's important to me that if I touch him in right flexion, that he still feels soft and he's willing to follow his nose. So as Jenny's walking here, I'm just gonna ask her to touch the right bit, see that he gets soft, good, and touch the left bit, see that he gets soft and gives to counter flexion, perfect. Yep, because Charmy's a little angel, awesome. And now watch the line of your circle. So already this way, 
we have a little bit noticing that Charmy would like to make the circle smaller. Good, good. This walk feel okay, Jenny? Yeah. Good, looks okay. If you're ready, we maybe take him to a little, a little working trot. And again, now Jenny's gonna put on her aid for trot and she has to decide, yes, that's in the box, that's acceptable for me, or it's not. And it's not to say that he might be lazy. Maybe he does too much. Maybe he goes to canter because he misunderstood. Either way, she has to measure yes or no. If the answer is yes, she's just gonna pet him and get on with the trot. If the answer is no, and Jenny says, that's not an acceptable answer for me, Charmy on my leg, but fine. Jenny, fine, on time? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so again, we're just feeling Charmy out today, right? What's the pace that he's picking for us? Good. And Jenny, how hard are you working? Okay, she says not too much at the minute. Now my goal in the warm up is to really kind of be like a, a, a bottle of pudding, right? Did you just cluck? Yeah. So see, now I don't have Jenny in my ear today because you guys have me in yours. <laughs> but, but when normally I have on the two way headsets, it's such a gift because I would hear Jenny cluck. So even if she's telling me she likes his tempo, that dressage rider on the inside is clucking right so i know that she wants him a little bit quicker so now i'm going to hold jenny accountable for saying hey girl right let's make a correction on your leg right put it on did you get the perfect reaction if you didn't bump 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 okay. make him a little sharp here even if he makes a little mistake good squeeze again your perfect aid does he go forward if he doesn't find your correction girl come yeah okay okay good you tell me when you like the tempo okay Ah, for me, he's slow again. Yeah? Good. Tap, tap. Say, so stay up there. He has to maintain that. Good. Touch your ideal aid. If he doesn't listen, let me see your correction. Right? For me, it's nice when the correction, good, come, come, is obvious. Come, come, come on the leg, forward. Good. Yeah, you can think a little leg yield thought there, but push him on. Good. Come to me, come to me, forward. There you are, there you are, good. When he's agreeing to stay a little bit that tempo, good, we can work the bridle like this. Good, forward. Come on, give him your leg. Very good. Let's change direction through the trot and see what he looks like tracking left. Good girl. Now for me, you'll notice I'm having Jenny keep Charmy a little bit around her inside leg. We talked about how he likes to get distracted. Good, good, and change direction to the left. And this has been a very good way to start him. 